Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, and follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome, friends, to another week of Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck. You know, today there's, the church is facing many challenges, and it can be quite discouraging. But I want you to know, in the midst of the challenges, there are great signs of hope. The king is in control, and he's already working through people throughout the church, sometimes that we don't even notice, through doing powerful things to help bring renewal and transformation to the life of the church. Today, I'm excited to welcome a very good friend and a man I admire tremendously, Ron Huntley from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Ron is a husband, he's a father, and he's part of a very dynamic team in Halifax. He and Father, Father James Mallon have been partnered with, a, and then together with a team of folks who help bring genuine renewal and transformation to parish life. Uh, right, right where they're living, but it's also now expanded. They're coaching people all around the world. We're, we're trying something new today, too, friends. We're, uh, Ronnie's in Canada, so he couldn't come. We're, we're uh, uh, recording this during the COVID period. Still, we had limitations, so we're doing this remotely, which is kind of fun. Ron, welcome. It's great to be here, Peter. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, I'm so glad to be with you. Uh, Ron, let's just start with your own personal story. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you ended up meeting the Lord and engaging his mission so, so, uh, so intensely, really. <laughs> well, yeah, I grew up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, my parents, uh, my mom's an Irish, faithful Irish Catholic lady who made sure that uh, God was a part of our life and the church was a part of our lives growing up. Um, I don't know if I was the best son in the world when it came to being studious in terms of my faith. I was the type of person who loved to run around and get in trouble and chase chase things and keep score, and uh, I was very energetic. So I found sitting in church and sitting in Sunday school uh, a challenge. Uh, but I love my prayer time with my mom at nights when we'd say our prayers at the end of the evening and pray for all of our relatives. And um, But I have to tell you, Peter, I remember being about, I don't know, nine or ten years old and as an altar boy. And uh, I remember being in the church, looking out at the crowd, and we were singing that song, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. And I remember thinking to myself, even as a young boy, this isn't true. And not that it's not true, but I didn't feel like it was true. I felt the gap between what I was experiencing by being a part of a church and what we sang about and we talked about. And even from that young age, I was aware of that gap. And the older I got, my awareness of that gap didn't go away. And I don't know why God gave me a passion for his church that it should be anything different than I experienced, but he did. And uh, so I grew up with this, watching my friends peel away from the church, their parents stopped going to the church. And, and when I was really young, it seemed like everybody went to church, but I was of that generation that I just watched people fall away in droves and it broke my heart. And to be quite honest with you, Peter, I don't know why I didn't leave too. I think God's grace, um, God had his hand on me because I didn't live a necessarily very Christian life. I was lost and confused and did a lot of things I would later regret. But I never lost my relationship with Jesus and always sought to figure out this church thing in a way that would be relevant to all the people that I know who have fallen away. And so that ache in my heart has been there since a very young age, yeah. When would you say, Ron, you began to uh, engage the Lord more consistently, personally, that began the kind of transformation that's led to the leadership you've been exercising in the church? 
I remember being 16 years old when my mom uh, invited me to go on a retreat. And let's just say it was a strong motherly invitation, one that you couldn't say no to. And I didn't want to go because I was heavily involved in sports and I had multiple games that weekend in two different sports, but I ended up going. And that weekend changed my life. It was a Curcio weekend. It, it, was a, it was a boys challenge. And sitting at that table with me was this other fellow who ended up getting brought home by the police. He was getting in a little trouble himself as he was searching and, and growing up. And parents made him go to this retreat as well. And we got to know each other and became good friends. His name was James Mallon, uh, Father James Mallon, who ended up writing the book Divine Renovation and inviting me into full-time ministry. And uh, that was the point in my life where I realized that Jesus knew me by name. Uh, that was that weekend was that transformation because I remember looking up at the cross and realizing he knew my name. He knew everything I've done, thought, and said, and he loved me anyway. And I knew I didn't deserve it. I knew his sacrifice, his mercy, and his forgiveness exceeded my worthiness, and it broke my heart. I remember crying and it changed me. Those tears washed over my anger, my bitterness, my hurt. And I left there a different person. I remember later that afternoon on that Sunday, mom picked me up a little early as a compensation for me, for, for me going on the retreat. But I didn't want to leave. Uh, and I had to go to a football game. Do you know how hard it is to play football when you have the love of Jesus in your heart so bad and you've just cried for, for, for that one? I, 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 it's an easier sport to play when you're full of hate and anger, but when you're full of love and joy and peace and you're exhausted from staying up too late, hanging out with brand new friends, it was a really hard game to play but it's a lot of fun. But I'd say that's the turning point for me in a very significant way. And believe me when I say there were many more prunings that the Lord's done in me as revelation, as he revealed himself to me over and over again. But I'd say that was the first one. You know, one thing we can't forget, I know there's a lot of moms and grandmas who are listening to the program. And it, it, what I've heard so far is maybe the key person in your life was your mother and your mother's faith and her willingness to take you to the well and to places of encounter. God bless her for that. What an amazing lady. Well, I was 19 years old. I was just talking with my son this weekend and uh, his sister, my daughter, Hannah, she's turning 19 in a couple of weeks. And I said, do you know what I did on my 19th birthday? That was the very first prayer meeting I ever went to. There's a charismatic renewal prayer meeting in Halifax. And my mom asked me if I'd go on my 19th birthday. She didn't have to fight me this time. But that was the very first encounter with a prayer meeting. And uh, yeah, my mom has been a rock in my life, always bringing me to Jesus, just like Mary, really, in so many ways. Well, moms and grandmas who are listening, let that touch your own heart. Every little step, every little prayer you pray, every attempt to lead your kids, when you're led by the Spirit to help them connect with the Lord and connect with the church, it matters. And the Lord's with you in it. Now, Ron, when, tell us now that there was, must have been a time when you and Father James kind of circled back together because you were involved, you had a career going, and Father had just gotten assigned to this new situation, this new parish in St. Benedict's, because it, like in lots of places in Atlanta, Atlantic Canada, the church was in free fall almost, and there was a kind of a managing a decline, and parishes were being merged together, and he was called in to try to do something and lead that situation. So why don't we take it from there? That was a special time in life. Anytime Father James and I would connect in the years preceding or following, sorry, our, our challenge weekend, it was just this magical connection. Uh, we, it, so it was a lot of fun. So I watched him as he came to the priesthood and, and began to do what he was doing. He would follow me. I started getting involved in Alpha and actually introduced him to Alpha at one point. And so we were always in each other's lives, um, not heavily, but we'd connect from time to time. I remember at one point, Probably 10 years before we ever connected, he said to me, we ran into each other, he said, Ron, if I could hire a director of evangelization, I would hire you. And I'd just wind you up and let you go because I know your heart. And I laughed my head. I said, Father James, you know you can't say that word. We're in the Catholic Church. You can't talk like that. He said, oh, it doesn't matter anyway. I don't have any money. That's probably never going to happen. And I'll bet you it was 10 years, 10 years later, I received a telephone call. Father James tells a story better than I do, but he said he was, he was on a, a trip where he was being mentored by Nikki Gumbel to be one of the speakers. And he was in a session, and he said it was like the Holy Spirit came upon him like 10,000 volts of lightning. He said, and the Holy Spirit said, 
you have to call Ron Huntley. And he said, I got up right in the middle of his presentation and I walked out. He said it was so strong, I had to act on it immediately. I was a pharmaceutical salesman and I was working in PEI at the time. I remember getting the call, I remember exactly where I was. And he said, Ron, it's Father James. I said, how are you? He said, great. He told me what just happened. He said, I really believe that God is calling us to work together in ministry. I've just been assigned this new church no one knows yet. And the Holy Spirit just told me that to call you. Would you come and work in ministry with me? And to be honest with you, Peter, that was at a point in my life where um, things weren't going so well in my current church. Uh, through a series of misunderstandings, uh, I just found myself on the outs. And it was very painful because I was always trying to lay my life down for the church and service to use my gifts to make a difference. And, and so it was a really, it was a difficult time for me. Father James knew what was going on because I'd reach out to him. But boy, I'll tell you, when he gave me that invitation, I felt like Peter in the boat, putting my hand up, looking away and saying, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. I, because I knew that was an invitation from God himself. And I felt unworthy. It was beautiful. It didn't take me long to discern. But I did have to discern because where he was inviting me to go was an hour away from where I was currently living. <laughs> and it would have required a move and uprooting my kids and all their sports programs. And, you know, as a father, Peter, you know what that would take. And so I invited them into the sermon process as well. And I told Father James I'd get back to him. I said, I probably couldn't do it full time because I still need to make a living and feed my family. And, and it's not always possible working on a church salary. Um, he said, part time, whatever, whatever you can do, I really feel we're called to, to work together. So I called him a couple days later and, and I was convicted of one thing. I, I, I called him a couple days later and I said, Father James, if you're calling me to build a church, I'm not interested. But if you think God's calling us together so we can impact the church, I'm all in. And he said, Ron, that's exactly what I feel God's calling us to do. We look back at that now and laugh because it was such a prophetic moment because we had no idea what that would mean. There was no concept of a, a ministry. There was no, he wasn't thinking about writing a book. We had no idea what God was going to do in us and through us if we came together through our friendship and our love for Jesus and the church. It's been a, quite a ride. Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's really, as you're speaking, Ron, I'm, I'm hearing the Holy Spirit. That is, how does the church actually grow? Programs, plans, things of that nature, they can be helpful. But the Spirit builds the church. And you hear uh, Father James is, is beginning to a new assignment in a parish that, as we were saying, was uh, a set of parishes that were in decline. It wasn't clear where it was going to go. But he was surrendered to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He reached out to you. You were open. You guys didn't have a grand plan. You actually had no experience doing what you're about to do. But you just said yes. You left your job. You left your career because you discerned it. You stepped into it. So what were some of the elements? What ended up unfolding then, Ron? I ended up working part-time for four years. And so I stayed in the pharmaceutical industry, and then I worked part-time working with Father James in the church. It was that year four that I discerned the call out of my career in sales and, and into full-time ministry. That was a scary decision, and Peter, you played a role in that as well. The Holy Spirit sent you into my life, and you're one of the people I turned to to talk to. So that was a difficult decision. But we were at a point, and this is a really good question to ask, Peter, because our success, because we were so convicted of what was possible, we just believe that if we don't start with evangelization, if we don't create holy chaos, we have to snap out of this way of doing church that doesn't work. And we were both convicted of that. We used Alpha as the tool, and that just woke people up in the pews. It immobilized us to go and reach others who've fallen away or don't go to church at all. And it changed the whole sense of passion and energy in the church, and it created a wonderful mess. But while that was going on, we weren't leading well. Our meetings weren't great. Our ability to support people was poor, and the morale on the staff was tanking, even though on the outside everything looked fantastic. Lives were changing, great things were happening, but there became a disconnect uh, in terms of the capacity to be sustainable. And that was a moment in our life, probably in year four, where we had a consultant come in and work with us thanks to a generous donor and somebody who really cared about Father James. And he came in and, and did this whole, interviewed all the staff 
And I'd already stepped away from ministry at that point. I just stepped away because I realized the success of Alpha and evangelization and connect groups was outgrowing my ability to work part-time. And my full-time job as a pharmaceutical industry, the responsibilities were increasing. And so I said, Father James, you need to hire somebody else. I need to step down and we need to bring somebody on full-time and maybe they can help the staff because they were struggling. And that's when uh, Brent came in and, and did some consulting for us. And that's when their discernment after that was over, Father James called me and said, Ron, we have the guy. And I'd kind of already helped him line somebody up. And I said, Father James, you better not change your mind. He said, no, you're the guy. And I thought, what are you talking about? You know I can't do that. He said, I know, that's what I told Brent. He said, but we all believe that you're the guy and we think we can make this work. And that's when I discerned to step out of, out of industry and into ministry. And um, that's when we changed the culture overnight. Uh, we started leading intentionally and on purpose. That's when we set up a senior leadership team. That's when we started to have consistent meetings. That's when we looked at our structure and how we led. So many churches um, see what's happened at St. Benedict Parish in terms of the transformed lives, and they want to see that for themselves. So then they copy the things we do. But what they don't realize is we had to grow as leaders because we didn't know how. We weren't doing it well. And that's what made what we did sustainable, not the programs, not just the passion. The passion and the programs created the holy chaos, but we needed to submit ourselves to constant growth as leaders and really be more intentional about how we spent time together, how we made decisions, what we prioritized so that we would be sustainable. I think one of the things that for the, for the I noticed early on the contact I began to have at St. Benedict's. I watched the transformation happen. And what I thought was unique was the transformation wasn't just, we got some people to come back to church, but it was a growing, vital community that was conscious of living in relationship with Jesus, was loving the sacramental life of the church, was starting to learn how to come together in community and to share it. But the big thing was reaching out to the unchurched. That was the thing that I was most almost shocked by how many people who were falling away from the church or who never were part of the church were coming and ordinary people from the pews were highly energized to go out and to lovingly bring people in because they, had, they themselves had met the Lord. And I think that's the instrument where the alpha piece fit in for you guys because it, it was a place of encounter. It was just a tool, it, but a place of encounter that, that helped people come into the life of the church. And then once you guys got organized, it sounds like to me, once you got organized, you're able to sustain better what was happening with people coming into the life of the church. 100%. I just had a conversation with somebody yesterday. I'm at a, a new parish called Christ the King, and it's not your church. It's a <laughs> We'll take you, though. We'll take you anytime. <laughs> and we met. Uh, anyway, I'm talking to this gentleman named Blair, and uh, he said he's going to be inviting his son and uh, his partner to the Alpha. And uh, it's, I'm just so excited about that because now he feels like he has a tool that his son who's fallen away from church may very well enjoy and appreciate and enter into a conversation and be accepted and be able to share his opinions and perspectives without really feeling pressured. And that's an environment that as a dad, he can share with his son. And I just think coming to Mass isn't necessarily that environment for a lot of us in terms of being able to engage in conversation like that. And we just need another on-ramp. We need another platform where we can engage the unchurched on their terms with their language. Because if we're not doing that, if we insist that we use our language, it's going to continue to be a barrier. And so it doesn't mean that eventually people aren't catechized and grow in the love for the sacramental church and mass and all the things that make our faith so beautiful. But, but our starting point is different in this generation. And, I, and we, try to, we try to acknowledge that. We try to be relevant in that space and be normal and not weird to those people who find church irrelevant. Yeah, one of the things that I found most personally moving and inspiring on some of the visits I made to St. Benedict's, I would, after mass, I would just kind of make my way around and just kind of grab ordinary people, young, old, and ask, you know, what's it, what's it like for you to be in this parish and why are you here and tell me your story? I was amazed how many, especially young people, had had no connection with the faith and ended up coming to the parish, but how, how free and how excited they were to bring their friends into that environment. 
and, and how much they consciously had discovered and uh, were engaging the mission of the church and felt like they had a purpose and a place in the King's mission of the Great Commission, which is so unique. And I think that's why, Ron, the, in my own opinion, just that's why the Lord has opened more doors. He had something larger in store for you guys right from the beginning to be an instrument to help the church move from maintenance to mission. And that's where divine renovation more broadly began to emerge. Is that right? Mm. Yes, I, I would say you're right. And the whole idea of mission, you know, Jesus does call us to feed the sheep, but he also calls us to go fishing. So we have to do maintenance and mission. The problem is sometimes we get so focused on the flock that we never really get around to going fishing. But I find when you prioritize fishing, you also take care of the flock. And so it's maybe putting first things first, and that's the primacy of evangelization. Very good. Tell us a little bit now about Divine Renovation, what's happening there. Divine Renovation as a ministry is really, you know, Father James just released another book, new book called Beyond the Parish, and it seems that his capacity, when he communicates his heart in writing, it connects with people. And when it connects with people, it's really created a wave of interest. And so he often gets asked to speak all over the world. And what's really cool is before the ministry, he would speak all over the world, inspire people, but we couldn't connect with them and equip them. And, and Divine Renovation as a ministry now is able to do all three of those things through the services and the people that we've recruited that also feel called to this mission, using their gifts and skills to really tell stories and connect people and equip them so that they can experience their own transformation in their parish based on their vision, the vision that God's placed on their hearts. And so it really is happening all over the world. One of the things I find over and over again, Peter, wherever I go, you know, I bet you if I, I went to, to Michigan, they'd say, oh yeah, but that's Halifax, Nova Scotia. So I'd say, oh, well, it's also happening in the United States. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's the southern part of the United States. No, but it's also happening in the northern part of the United States. Yeah, but we're, on the, we're in the central area. We're not on the East Coast. Like People continue to make excuses why they're so unique and, and it probably wouldn't work there. But what we find is as people implement these principles with, an, with a spirit of openness and a passion for what God wants to do in this age, in their parish, through their leadership, it works. And so it always makes my day when people from different parts of the globe connect and start sharing the issues they face because what people are finding is the issues are the same right across the world. I mean, there's some nuances, but those are small. But my great hope is if the problems are the same around the world, I wonder if it's possible that the solutions might be the same too. And what we're finding is we're able to help a lot of people. And it's really exciting. Excuse me, Ron. What would you say are the key elements that you are communicating when you're trying to help a, a parish kind of align itself with the Lord's you know, purpose of call to holiness and call to mission together, that transformation? What are the, the keys? Yeah. We, we recently went through a new branding process and, and and we literally have three keys as our brand for divine renovation. And those three keys are the primacy of evangelization, the best of leadership principles, and the reliance on the power of the Holy Spirit. And those three keys are joined by a keychain, which, which represents the Eucharist and our sacramental faith. But it's those three things that are the key to opening up something new. Some people say, well, how come prayer's not there? Well, Prayer is essential, but it's not necessarily a key because there are lots of churches that are very faithful in praying, but they're dying. Well, and so there are lots of things that are essential to our faith, but aren't necessarily keys to renewal. And so those three keys are the primacy of evangelization, the best of leadership principles, and a reliance on the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. And we really believe that as we lean into those things, we unpack those things with pastors and their teams, it changes everything. When I say the word teams, that's one of the other essentials. We, we insist if we're going to coach people, that deep dive coaching, there's multiple levels of connecting and equipping people in the ministry right now. The one that I oversee is coaching, and the coaching is a deep dive, and we won't coach anyone if they're not willing to work out of a team. Because we believe, Father James says all the time, we, we don't think there's any such thing as a well-rounded leader, but there can be well-rounded teams. And when pastors learn how to work out of a team, it transforms their priesthood. It makes the quality of their decisions far better. 
and they don't feel like they're alone anymore. It's not an easy thing to do because a lot of lay people don't know how to work and speak into the clergy, and a lot of clergy don't know how to collaborate and work with lay people in a way that's transformational. I heard one time there's a difference between a working group and a high performance team. And when we work with pastors, we're trying to help them learn how to work out of a high performance team. And I heard somebody say one time that a person, most people will only ever be on a high performance team once in their lifetime. I thought that's so, that's so sad. We want to help people be great. Ron, we just have a few minutes left. I want to help our listeners connect with a book you and Father James wrote called Unlocking the Parish. You want to say just a word about it? Yeah, we really believe that uh, we've been coaching people on how to run Alpha well in their churches to really create that, that holy chaos, to inspire and invite people to encounter Jesus afresh and anew and to be filled with the Spirit. And there's so many things that people can do wrong. Alpha in itself is not a silver bullet and it can be done poorly. And in fact, I would say many times it is. And so we wrote that book because we've been helping people for years do it well. And so we thought, why don't we write a book and take a lot of the, the things that we're learning and seeing and really inject it into this book so that people can be equipped, but also help people overcome the objections. Chapter two is one of my favorite chapters. Of course, Father James wrote it, and it really helps address the fact that Alpha wasn't founded in the Roman Catholic Church, because for some people, they won't even try it because of that. And for those of you that might feel that way, I want you to know I understand. But get the book, read chapter two, and send me an email. <laughs> Ron, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for the work you and Father James and your whole team are doing. God bless you. I uh, hope you can join us again sometime. Thank you very much. Friends, I want to offer you a new booklet I just wrote called Fear God and Give Him Glory. This is a time of transformation and lifting up the person of Jesus. I want to, we want to offer this to you uh, free of charge just for the asking. There'll be a brief booklet spot after this where you can get the information on how to get the booklet. Until next week, this is Peter Herbeck and Ron Huntley saying, let's continue to walk in the mission of the church and the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. One of the most overlooked yet foundational spiritual gifts is the fear of the Lord. The scriptures call this gift a fountain of life, a source of confidence in the beginning of wisdom. Today, our culture, politics, and even the church are in crisis. Everyone can see the deep division, the escalation of anger and violence, and whole nations seem to be in the grip of fear. We have come to fear the wrong things, the opinions of men and losing our idols. The fear of God is not in the land, and God in his mercy is shaking the nations to wake us up so we hear his word. Do not fear what this people fear. Rather, fear God and give him glory. In this booklet, I explain the fear of the Lord, why it is an antidote to the current crisis, and how you can awaken this gift in your life. To receive a free copy, visit our website or call the number on the screen.